Hello, Town of Rochester. As we dive into the third and final video of the Town of Rochester series, we will learn the development of economic industry and how it changed over the course of the centuries through developments, technology, and diverse changes in the land, people, and priorities. The early development of the Town of Rochester was based primarily on the agricultural economy. European settlers first began to venture into the Rondout Valley in the 1600s after the Asopas Wars had pretty much destroyed the resident Native American culture there. Wheat farms began in the Rondout Valley floodplains. Area farmers became prosperous exporters of agricultural produce by working the rich Rondout Valley Basin. The agricultural economy changed drastically after the Revolutionary War. Exhausted soils, blights, and increase in productive farms crippled the Hudson Valley wheat economy and new agricultural products were introduced with new farming methods. Agriculture continued to be the dominant economic force throughout the 19th century. In the 1845 census reported that fully 68% of people were farmers. Many farmers also had side jobs. Small mills of all varieties were soon built and sprang up nearby streams flowing from the mountains. Even though mills were important in the history and development of the town during the 18th and 19th centuries, they couldn't provide a stable livelihood for families because the operation of a mill was contingent upon an aqueduct water supply and the town streams weren't capable of supplying either the fall or the volume of water necessary for a large water powered mill community. The largest mill complex was located at Mill Hook on Metacahonks Road. Unfortunately, no structures remain. Mill Hook was one of the only areas of the town that approached industrial center status, but water was too sporadic to develop into a traditional mill town. The only standing mill related to structures remaining today is located on Canyon Lake Road in Ackward. Hoop shops were another form of industrial endeavor that existed in the town. Most of these small one-man operations are found in the upland areas of town and are an important part of its history. In 1855, listed businesses in the town of Rochester were four grease mills, four coach and wagon shops, one boat builder shop, four blacksmith shops, one charcoal maker, three copper shops, eight sawmills, two millstone makers, and one carden mill. All these employed 81 people. On the other hand, there were 6,638 acres of land and pasture, 9,163 acres planted in oats, rye, barley, and corn, 243 acres in potatoes, and 3,051 acres of apple orchards, four acres of turnips, and an acre of flax. By 1875, smaller family farms began to disappear and larger, more efficient farms were taking their place. Crop production shifted and was now divided fairly between even Indian corn, oats, buckwheat, and rye. Dairy farming continued as a strong endeavor with butter as the principal product. The diversity of field crops when put together with hay meadows, pastures, orchards, and gardens created a complex patchwork of spaces in the 19th century farms. During the year of 1860 to 1930, the town of Rochester was known for its Huckleberry Festival. Campers came for huckleberry season from late June to August. They pitched tents and made lumber and tar paper shacks. The boom of the berry pickers lasted from the turn of the century to around 1930. As technology changed and development advanced, so did the way of life for residents in the town of Rochester. In 1825, the construction of the DNH Canal began and lasted for three years. The hand dug channel had 110 locks and was 108 miles of waterway used sometimes for passengers, but mainly to carry large amounts of material and produce. The Peterskill was the main feeder to the canal. Lock 21 was located in Allegraville and Lock 23 was located in Accord. Canal stores were located near the locks. The stores would have peep windows to watch for canal boats and a door at the ground level making it easy to do transactions. Often fresh produce was purchased or shipped. Lock 23 was known for selling asparagus and scallions. Lock 21 had a boat building and a dry dock for repairs. Millstones were bought down the mountain from Mohonk and used in trade at Lock 21. The Orange, the first boat to navigate the entire canal, left the Rondeau on October 6, 1828. 
On December 5, 1828, the first shipment of coal, which was 11 boats carrying 10 tons, each arrived at the Rondo. Canal travel was reliable for heavy materials, but never truly accepted for passenger travel, so horse-drawn stages were still important transportation routes. Canal travel was often uncomfortable and usually too slow for the post office, or for travelers who wished to arrive at a destination quickly. Additionally, the canal didn't operate during the winter weather that would freeze water in the canal ditches. The arrival of the canal in the town of Rochester also introduced different architecture styles of homes. Stone constructed homes were replaced by wooden framed homes. The 19th century was a prosperous time for Rochester as evidenced by the consolidation of farms, the building of fine new homes, and the expansion of existing ones. The D&H Canal was eliminated in the Rochester area in 1901, leaving behind its canal, boats, buildings, and a way of life that slipped quietly into our past. With an increased population and booming hamlets, faster transportation was needed. Railroads had begun to operate and were more reliable and cheaper. In 1902, the Ontario and Western Railroad extended services from Ellenville to Kingston through the town of Rochester. Accord and Kaiserac were the two rail stops in the town of Rochester. Accord soon developed as the center of business and civic activity in the township. The largest business to develop in Accord was Anderson's Feed Mill. The mill developed and prospered as a secondary outgrowth of expanding agricultural market in the township and soon became a prominent supplier of mixed feed in area dairy farms. The grains and other products sold there were brought in on the railroad, reducing the need to grow a broad range of crops and instead focusing on individual products. Other businesses that began to thrive during this time was the Weissman store and the Turner and Cohen store. Mike Palmer was the station master in an accord from the time the station was built in 1902 until his retirement shortly before it closed in 1956. also had an effect on the agricultural community in Rochester. The most important aspect of this was the opening of creameries to receive pasteurized and shipped milk at Kaiserac, Accord, and Kerhonkson stations. The Kaiserac Creamery was soon built after the railroad had opened and was one of the first plants of its type in the valley. The introduction of this plant made profound impacts upon area farms. For the first time, it was practical to produce milk for consumption. Prior to this, butter had been the chief dairy product of the farms. Now milk could be collected at the creamery and transported by rail while still fresh to New York City. Rochester had three dairy operations. This new expansion of milk market increased and enlarged the dairy herds throughout Rochester. With trains, small thriving tourist industry came. Tourist trade flourished and would become an important economic factor. The train bed followed roughly the course of the old canal bed and provided direct access to New York City. Since automobiles were scarce, it was easy for a family from New York City to hop on a train and two hours later be in the Catskill or Shawangunk Mountains. Summer escapes to the mountains have become a popular excursion. Steamers and rail lines along the Hudson delivered guests to the mountains, making resorts more accessible to the common man. beautiful lakeside locations that soon attracted many guests began in 1860 when two Quaker brothers Alfred and Albert Smiley came to the Schwangunk Ridge and visited Lake Mohonk. By 1869 the two brothers bought 300 acres around Lake Mohonk and founded the Mohonk Mountain House which still remains in operation today. Several years later Alfred saw Lake Minnewaska then called Coxing Pond a sparkling blue lake on the Schwangunk Ridge carved out by the glacier some 10,000 years ago. Using Pennsylvania lumber brought in by the D&H Canal, the two brothers began to construct the hotel at the lake which they renamed Lake Minnewaska after a mythical Indian maiden. 
These two resorts prospered for, through the first half of the 20th century and became a well-beloved vacation retreat for those with an eye of nature and love of peace and quiet. Another popular prosperous summer resort was Dreamland Farm, which many may know as the former Camp Epworth. Dreamland had a reputation of appealing to guests who were looking for energetic activities and a lively social scene. Dancing was a favorite pastime here and guests were treated to farm fresh eggs, milk, cream, and vegetables, with all the food being home cooked or baked. In a 1936 published brochure, the O&W Accord Station promotes 54 different establishments of numerous boarding houses, guest houses, hotels, bungalow colonies, camps, and cottages to rent during the summer in Rochester. the Peg Leg Bates Country Club in Gerhonkson opened and was successfully operated for 36 years by well-renowned Broadway dancer Clayton Peg Leg Bates and his wife Alice, making him the first black resort owner in Ulster County. As transportation improved, many moved on to purchase summer homes. Travel by plane became more popular and destinations to islands and other countries as well. Today, agricultural is still the number one business tourist attraction in Rochester, with family-owned businesses such as Saunderskill and Kelder's Farms, Arrowwood, Westwind, and Rough Cup Breweries, Whiteman's Apple Orchard, and Bell's, Marshall's, and Sutton's Christmas Tree Farms. This concludes the final video of our series. The information presented in each of these videos can be found in town archives located at our local museum and at the town clerk's office. If you enjoy hearing and reading stories of our local history, I encourage you to become a member of our Friends of Historic Rochester Museum. For as little as $20 per year, you will receive a quarterly accordion subscription and access to visit our museum for genealogy and town archives.